Okay, great. <laughs> um, great. Okay, so just to introduce myself, my name is Sana, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Artist Programs Coordinator at STEPS Public Art. Um, so STEPS develops one-of-a-kind one public art plans, installations, and engagement strategies that foster vibrant communities. Um, and this talk is also hosted by the Klondike Institute of Art and Culture in Dawson City. Um, so this talk uh, is Art in Alternative Spaces, and it's put on by, as part of our Create Space programming. And Create Space is a national program designed in consultation with advisors from coast to coast, and it provides Black, Indigenous, and racialized artists with the skills and relationships and practical experience needed to grow their public art practice. Um, so tonight we're in conversation with Amar Mahamwala, Florence Yi, Philip Ocampo, and Bo Young, and I'm going to turn the conversation over to them in just a minute. But first, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the sacred land on which we are meeting tonight. Um, we are in the interesting position of existing both virtually and in physical space across Turtle Island. Um, Steps Public Art resides in the meeting place of Ticoronto. Um, it's been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. The territories include the Huron-Wendat um, Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas uh, of the Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. I personally am coming to this meeting from Mokinsis in Treaty 7 territory. Um, as a public art organization, we recognize our privilege in working on stolen and unceded lands and are working to unlearn colonial structures and move towards reconciliation. A land acknowledgement is not a whole story. It is, in fact, a very small first step. Um, so STEPS also invites you to share which nation's territory that you are on in the chat. Um, if you are unsure or if you would like to know more, you can visit uh, nativeland.ca, which I will pop in the chat box. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over our conversation to the viewers, uh, so they can, or to the speakers, <laughs> so they can share where they are joining from and a little bit about themselves before moving into the conversation. Someone want to start? <laughs> uh, I'll pass it to uh, somebody. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll start. Oh, <laughs> oh the boss. I got it. All right. <laughs> um, uh, I am Cantonese artist that live uh, currently in Dawson City, also known as Trondic Wichin Territory, um, which is probably pretty far from um, most big cities. And so this is a very pretty small community of 2000. Um, yeah, so my art practice uh, mostly is uh, installation, um, public, interventions, I guess, and um, uh, performances. And uh, I'm on the board of Kayak, the Klondike Institute of Art and Culture, and part of the gallery committee there. And um, yeah, so the two main projects that I can think of that kind of uh, um, is part of alternative spaces, I guess, and is um, the one that I recently did with uh, Meg Walker and Georgia Hammond here. Um, it's like a public online publication um, of um, the Trondic Wichin territory. And yeah, actually I should not dig deep too deep into it because we'll talk about all the other projects later. So yeah, and most of my work has to do with the um, diaspora, but um more intimately with my family and the ancestors that have echoed these conversations and hasn't stopped to really look at what the conversation is so i i'm really curious about that and how i move through uh my community and relationships yes the end and up over there somewhere <laughs> Thanks, Bo. That was, that was lovely. I was having trouble unmuting myself. I was happy to go first, but technological challenges. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Amar Mahimala. I'm calling in today from the traditional homelands of the Lekwungen people, who are today known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation. And for most people, that's known as Victoria. My background's in um, public art and not for profit management and curatorial practices. I've worked on public art installations across the lower mainland with the Vancouver Biennale for five years. And before that, I worked in a museum in a very colonial and a decolonizing context in India. And that kind of really opened my eyes to the, the importance of public space and the value of arts and kind of bringing people together and fostering difficult but important conversations. So I'm excited to be here and, and to hear more and kind of chat with, with everybody else on this call. Maybe I'll turn it over to Philip. I think he might have the same challenge I was having with unmuting himself. Okay, great. <laughs> I was like, um, who should I who should I message in this chat <laughs> to say that I can't unmute myself? But um, thanks for passing it to me. Um, my name is Philip Leonardo Campo. Um, I'm a freelance um, curator and artist based here in Takaranto, which is where I am currently. Um, I think what's most relevant about my practice in terms of the conversation that we're going to have today is my experience um, as one of the four co-directors of Hearth, um, which is an artist-run space here in the city. Um, totally DIY, we operate out of a garage. Um, so there definitely is uh, a lot of room for like flexibility in what we do. And I'm excited to talk a bit about that. Um, additionally, um, I'm one of the programming coordinators at X-Space Cultural Center, which is an artist-run center also here in Takaranto um, that's dedicated to supporting the professional development of emerging artists, designers, writers, you name it. Um, not necessarily related in this conversation in that it is an alternative art space because it's not, it's an artist-run center, um, but uh, from working full-time at you know, a space an institution and then working basically every other waking hour of mine uh, at this space uh, that runs a bit more precariously. Uh, I'm excited to, I don't know, maybe put into words some of these uh, complicated and complex um, learning lessons I've had from balancing both spaces in a curatorial practice. So thank you for having me. And then I pass it on to Florence. And then I, I guess also the mute thing. Yes, yes, thank you for that. Um, hi everyone, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Florence Yee. Uh, I'm coming from Toronto 3, Treaty 13 territory tonight. Um, I am a visual artist and a serial collaborator. Uh, the most recent of which uh, is the Chinatown Biennial that I am uh, working on with uh, Arezu Salamzadeh, uh, another artist here, but specifically um, in Mississauga. Uh, and um, I, I have a, a lot of experience with um, precarity in the arts. <laughs> and uh, I've, um, I don't think I've had an institutional position as to date. Uh, but I've, I've uh, spent a lot of time in academia um, and uh, TAing, and I think um, there's a lot of parallels there too. So happy to have this conversation with everybody. Thank you very much to our interpreter, Christina. So I think actually Florence, you it'd be a good place to start with outside of institutional context for our conversation today. I think, you know, for those of us who have been in those spaces and those of us who haven't, there's there's opportunities, but there's obviously trade-offs with working outside institutional spaces. And, and for me, I mean, just, you know, starting off working in alternative spaces within an institution because recognizing there are these boundaries, but at the same time, we want to try and work outside of those boundaries. And it's often looking at community groups or individuals on the outside to try and create that space 
for them. So I think yeah, I'd love to hear hear more, maybe in the Chinatown Biennial or some of the other projects that you're working on outside of institutional contexts. Yeah, um, the projects that I've been a part of have really been a, like a lifelong lesson that I'm also still learning and relearning every day. I think the very first collective I was a part of uh, was in Montreal. It was a francophone group called Arsib. Um, Art Target would be the uh, translation of that. Um, and I, I was a part of that for almost a whole year before leaving because there was um, a kind of intense but also underlined uh, racism that was in especially the francophone, mostly white art scene. Um, but it was also just a general societal misunderstanding of what racialization was at the time, um, 2016. Like I rarely, if not never, heard the word white spoken in French. Um, and so I think there was um, a lot. Uh, the DIY that was happening in Montreal was a lot uh, more stemming from universities. And so that's. Uh, when I got into Concordia, I was um, mostly in, yeah, as you were saying, Amar, these kind of offshoots of smaller groups within institutions, uh, one of which that I, I credit a lot to kind of seeing how groups can be sustainable is, um, was founded by uh, Dr. Alice Mingwai Jim. Uh, she founded the EAR group, the Ethnocultural Art history research group. <laughs> e I love a good acronym. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was it was funded mostly through her uh, Canada Research Council chair position, and so there was always this like tie in with um, funding. And uh, the Chinatown Biennial is somewhat the same way. Um, we uh, sought funding from. Um, the Toronto Arts Council, and we got that. But before that, our ideas were very different. Uh, at first, we were just going to run the Chinatown Biennial as a complete parody, um, not having uh, any real artists to speak of, just myself and Rezu disguised as many other artists. <laughs> um, it was going to be something of a drag show. Uh, and when we actually got the grant, we thought this was the opportunity to support many other emerging artists. And so um, that was when it turned into part uh, parody and part real biennial. Um, but uh, the first and longest lesson that I'm still uh, learning, I'm glad to be able to have this opportunity is how, how much slower things can be if they're run um, just uh, by two people who do not see the emergency of the deadline, um, that there, there's a lot more of a relationality with all of our artists, who um, the majority of which, because we made this during the pandemic, uh, for one reason or another, asked us for extensions. Um, and so we've been able to have um, a more adaptive and accommodating way of working as well, I think, as just a, a, a far less surveilled way of working with artists, um, both like for the people who participate with us and then the people who see the work who are themselves, like I feel a lot less shy to talk about us, uh, talk about the work with us when we were like just near the work um, because it's not within this white walled gallery. Uh, so those are some of the first things I noticed. Um, yeah, what about you, Philip? I was there at your last uh, amazing uh, hearth party. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess like maybe I can just talk a bit more about hearth and what, what we do there. Um, yeah, and thanks, thanks, Lawrence, for for coming to that. Um, hearth, uh, we opened in the winter of 2019. So as you can imagine, it was probably the worst time to open an artist friend space. 
Um, I think that the challenges that the pandemic has presented have been really um, hard, but also uh, great learning experiences. Um, yeah, and I think generally speaking, you know, we do operate out of a garage and, you know, Toronto is a very expensive city. So um, a garage is kind of all we could afford. Um, people often ask me uh, about, you know, what I think about how um, we are in a space that isn't like um, an insulated, like indoor space and having to operate out of a garage, they're like, oh, it must be so, it's like so weird or it's so, um, yeah, there's generally a sort of like uh, peculiarness to operating this art space out of this site that isn't usually meant for art in this context. And I'm always kind of like, yes, it, it does allow us to have a lot of like a flexibility and like site specific sort of um, interesting dialogues, but um, we really moved into a garage because it's all we could afford. So, you know, I do feel like there's this sort of romanticization of uh, alternative spaces. And although it is a lot of fun to run, um, we did it because we had to. And I think it mirrors the kind of precarity that is, you know, uh, rampant in like Toronto in terms of art spaces. Um, and yeah, I think generally more musings I have about it is um, we, you know, I work quite young. All of us graduated from university or currently in university um, in like 2018. So that's actually very recent. Um, and we started Hearth because um, we wanted something that we weren't seeing in the city, which is like a site for experimentation, a site for projects that are weirder, um, a site for um, exhibitions that feature like young emerging artists, but also a dialogue between artists who are more established um, and mid-career. So, you know, it was this really interesting dynamic of, and it is still this interesting dynamic of really you know, being mentors and offering mentorship and supporting artists while um, being artists and emerging facilitators ourselves. So there is wasn't this kind of like um, generational or sort of like mentorship or learning experiences uh, helping us figure figure things out on our end. It was kind of just like being tossed into it, into it and, you know, um, yeah. I always think of the, um, phrase uh, who watches the watchmen <laughs> because it's really a matter of like you know we are emerging facilitators ourselves so what does it mean to um you know grasp towards having the answers in terms of precarity in the arts in the city um when we are ourselves facing precarity that's the ramble oh also i guess i should say um i just forgot to mention but my pronouns are he him uh, and I'm a Pisces. You didn't ask, but now you know. <laughs> I'm tossing it to Bo. <laughs> oh, 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 I unmuted. Um, uh, yes, I made some juices flow about uh, alternate, like the precarity of alternative spaces. I, I want to echo that too, with even in small communities, um, when there isn't gallery space, you kind of have to, uh, use, uh, like, especially in the community, everyone's like emerging facilitators as artists trying to create uh, like outdoor festivals in the winter and like, you know, and uh, even like out in for kayak because there's only two galleries and want to, you know, have as much uh, artists and art in the weekend. And so like, the Riverside Arts Festival is all over a small town. Like in, so it's like using, again, like partnering with other community members and Parks Canada to use like old buildings to be um, gallery uh, spaces and installations. Um, yeah, so there's, yeah, precarity in the, all those spaces. And it's like that kind of, tether tug of um, 
when you're in institutions, you there's this uh, like responding to funding and there's this money te tether to it. And then when you're doing more DIY alternative uh, spaces, there isn't that much money, but you have to use labor and time to, you know, keep that space going. So there's just like, oh yeah. And, but there's also possibilities in alternative spaces that, yeah, that you can really experiment. And um, there aren't the four walls, white walls to um, reframe or edit your pieces in that space. And so, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, whoever wants to add to it. <laughs> I should have a question. I mean, just thinking about alternative spaces and and DIY spaces in our different contexts from small cities to, to big urban centers. Through the pandemic, that sort of changed all of our lives in so many different ways and our routines. So, I mean, for each one of you, what kind of spaces did you re-explore or were newly introduced to that you would consider or have considered or have kind of brought your practice into? Oh, even if it's virtual or if it's a grocery store, you know, I mean, just thinking about even lockdowns yeah. where certain parts of the countries, the only things that were open were grocery stores and pharmacies or in other places where, you know, there wasn't tourism or there wasn't festivals and everybody, that word pivot is way overused, but really more of a mental pivot for, for you three here as artists and, and cultural workers for seeing opportunities for new spaces. I guess I'll add to the the online publication the uh, with um, two of my friends, Meg Walker and Georgia Hammond, uh, that did the Long Walk Collective where we yeah, invited over 20 artists and writers to um, talk about their uh, relationship to plants specifically here. So there was indigenous and slower um, people of color, artists and writers to um, talk about uh, the, the Ninth Avenue Trail in Dawson. So, and there was an urgency to like, for, to make art and to support artists and writers. And um, yeah, and we, yeah, and that virtual or like having it on a website was, uh, it was like a connection to the specific site, but it was also a connection to how, what your relationship was in uh, the community as well. So yeah, and I guess, yeah, that's the accessibility piece of um, that. It's not just uh, Dawson can experience, but also like outside of this community as well. Yeah, I'd like to think of accessibility, not just like the, the fact that you can access it 24 seven for free, but also uh, at least um, the way that some of the work in the Chinatown Biennial is done, but also that there's multiple different formats that we can make the work into so that it, it can kind of reach people. Um, I was just having a another talk with um, Larry Gachampong and um, he described these as soft encounters where you aren't exactly primed to view art or to think of anything as art, but you're able to see it, um, like I was kind of describing with less surveillance. And I think that might be um, one of the more magical things about it, but also accessibility in terms of um, being able to uh, like ask for what you need, um, both material and like uh, time and um, support. And uh, we're trying to also get the Chinatown Vinyl uh, into a catalog, but uh, a catalog of kind of letters between um, Arezu and I so that there could be at least some forms that can be tangibly archived, some forms that could be reached from the internet, some forms that could be uh, seen on the street. Um, 
I, I very much echo that one of the coolest things that came out of the pandemic was this ability to kind of make publications with a lot of people that we weren't collaborating with before. Um, and uh, as well, um, I've been putting my, my work mostly on like billboards and street signs, posters that are just on lamp posts or something like that. And so there's this kind of um, call and answer that happens, uh, I think, in, in the wild of the, of the street. Um, but I also, uh, actually, we'll get to that later. <laughs> Um, and maybe like um, maybe I can talk a bit more about like um, what Hearth has been up to since the pandemic hit. Um, so this alternative space had to get even more alternative when we couldn't couldn't invite anyone into the space to see anything. So I mean, like a lot of spaces, uh, we faced the question of you know where do you go from here? Um, what does uh, not in person um, programming look like? Um, we really turned to things like um, we were asking artists to put together playlists and mixes to share. We were, um, you know, just working a lot in like digital publication and um, just straightforwardly doing like virtual um, exhibitions and other uh, sorts of projects. Uh, for example, uh, we have a writing project called Erotic Awakenings. It's a um, project that we started, I think, in July of 2020 with Fan Wu, who's a writer in Toronto. Um, we were asking participants to like share um, really formative uh, erotic experiences uh, in writing. It could be totally uh, nonlinear. It could be poetry. It could be prose. Um, it could be comics, uh, and we just basically like decided to create this archive that lived on the Hearth website. Uh, and we still ongoingly publish volumes and um, it's like free to submit to and we're pretty lax about, you know, um, who we accept. So basically anybody that wants to um, have writing in the project, we allow. Um, and additionally, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, in art spaces, uh, now that we're so far from where the pandemic was, we're in such a different place now. I think, you know, people are kind of getting sick of like digital or online programming. Everybody just wants to be in space again. Um, I have always seen the value um, in virtual projects or projects that aren't physical. Um, I always think about the fact that like, you know, for diaspora communities, um, digital and virtual communication is kind of built into it, right? Like I, growing up was, that's the only way I kept in touch with my cousins from the Philippines was through like Yahoo Messenger and like MSN Messenger and like Facebook. Um, and additionally, like I'm, <laughs> I'm a child of the internet, right? So it's like, like I remember, um, you know, being in like grade eight and like downloading things off like LimeWire and like <laughs> putting together like Tumblr blogs and like blog spots to like just share like random musings about nothing. So um, in the scheme of, you know, what you can do outside of physical context when the pandemic hit, like for me, the it was really inspiring. The floodgates were really open. Um, also, I should mention before I conclude what I was saying, um, when we were able to do in-person shows again, uh, the flexibility of hearth as an alternative space came into play because, um, you know, I always say that it's not four walls, it's three walls then just outside because there is a massive garage door. So as long as the weather was nice, you know, we really were abiding by outdoor COVID rules versus indoor COVID rules. And in terms of like capacity limits and such, uh, which really allowed us to, um, you know, invite people back into the space safely and in a way that we felt comfortable doing. So there was a point of time in which virtual projects or not in-person projects were happening concurrently um, with actual exhibitions, which was a great middle ground. And I hope that we can still continue that. Um, I might've mentioned this before, but we are in a garage that's not really insulated. So it's a little cold this time of year. 
so we are going to go on a hiatus for the winter just because like you can't you you're at your hands and holding the hammer and trying to install a thing you just like shake too much it's too cold so you know um the flexibility can only go so far uh in terms of the garage itself but you know artists are resourceful like creative people like we are creative for a reason and you know in these um winter months we are planning on like doing another volume of erotic awakenings and like um potentially like starting a newsletter that's like kind of experimental in that regard too um and other forms of like uh sharing you know what we do and what the community is doing uh with everyone else um speaking about the limits of a the flexibility i was wondering if any of you because i don't have an answer to this if if any of you have had thoughts about what um what accountability looks like for alternative spaces and who are we responsible to in alternative spaces? Um, I think one of the large reasons for the turnover of, um, uh, kind of alternative groups as well is that there isn't, um, there isn't a, a way to come back after a crisis or kind of we're all so tightly put together that there isn't um, there isn't enough distance uh, or from like so many reasons so yeah I was wondering if you had thoughts maybe maybe Amar yeah so that's I was just thinking about that actually as you're as you're talking I mean I think from an institutional perspective I think accountability to to so many different communities and and really just using sort of more of a trust-based model where you know, through the pandemic, like I think a lot of governments at all levels figured out really quickly on how to be agile or how to kind of, you know, do things that were previously considered not normal or not possible. You know, I mean, at the city of Victoria, I think one of the programs my colleagues started just to support artists through the early months of the pandemic was sort of an everyday creativity grant program where it was really artist centered and community centered, where it was community groups could come and pitch their project and there was funding available for them to realize in whatever shape or form they felt comfortable with and given the parameters of a pandemic and remote working or working from home, working in isolation. So yeah, it definitely brings up questions of, of accountability and, and who you should be responsive to. But I think it also opens up new opportunities for, for artists to self-define, right? And self-create those, those boundaries as opposed to institutions, you know? So I think it's kind of decentering that authority or that decision-making ability of framing the context. And I don't think we have an, I mean, I don't think there's an institutional answer to this. And I think that's partially why maybe some of this work wasn't done before because that fear of not knowing, well, who, who are we kind of connected to or who would we be responding to specifically? It's scary, but I think it's also it's an opportunity to to reflect on how we can kind of reorient this context, especially within online and in person formats, right? Where it's no longer our local community, so to speak, the people we see and interact with every day, but it's people from afar too now. Yeah, I've I've actually um, personally seen that working with people from provinces where you don't live, or just anywhere where you don't live it comes with a whole lot of like new baggage that you're not familiar with the oral traditions aka gossip of the region um and it's so important to me that one of the we, we talk about this with the gendai collective all the time how one of the very important things that we haven't been able to do much during the pandemic is gossiping like keeping each other safe by like informing each other of like what has happened and what places are mistreating their workers or anything like that because there isn't time to speak like private there's like the the private message function of a zoom chat and that's like basically it um there's no um there isn't a, a an unscheduled time to get together um and that's kind of like ignited a lot of community conflicts 
in, in my experience. That's such a, I find like accountability can, I mean, for me is in both spaces, you know, it's like com such different languages and institution spaces come, I think in, in compared to alternative spaces. Um, but yeah, like, um, yeah, accountability to the community and the work that you do and what are you, what is this offering and is, and like, how are you offering it is also, um, yeah, I don't really have an answer, but I would, yeah, it's something to think about and, or like, yeah, when you have a conflict within the, that space and, and especially here when it's, there's no like leaving you you're you'll see the person in a grocery store <laughs> 30 minutes after this conflict or so yeah I guess the, it's a little bit different here but I don't think I'm yeah it's not an answer but just like processing what does that mean how do you transform these relationships when there is such a yeah tension Attention to the tension. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I I I think um uh it's certainly interesting the topic of accountability. Um as I was saying before, like we are a member, like hearth, the four of us, uh we are members of the constituency that we serve. Um, so there is this sort of responsibility in terms of representing this um group of artists at a certain period of time, um, which can, you know, the pressure is real, I'd say. Um, but we also, I think when the four of us started, um, we got together and we kind of agreed that we were just going to um, do this thing for um, however long we could or however long um, felt right. And that definition kind of reverberates to many different things. It could be like logistical, could be creative. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the precarity of the artist run space model um, is, is palpable and it's, it's important and it's there. But I think throughout the past two years, because uh, yesterday was our two year birthday. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're working with the acknowledgement that like we, it is precarious and that, um, you know, the, the cycle of life and death with artists run spaces is, is natural and it's okay. Um, the reason why we called ourselves hearth, um, was because, um, I guess the long spiel is, uh, the garage was a site of a fire that burned down the building beside it. Um, we moved in a few years later um and you know we were we wanted a name that referenced the site that it was in but we were also thinking of hearth as like one a gathering point you know a hearth you cook food over it so it gathers people towards it and towards each other um so we wanted to represent community in that regard but also um fire as both um um destructive and creative you know so um we kind of are working within this acknowledgement that like, you know, um, if I guess not to like bludgeon the metaphor, but like if, if the, the hearth flame pitters out, it could always reemerge again. Right. So there's this knowingness of like, um, we're doing this here, we're doing this now, we're doing this for ourselves and our friends and our peers. And, you know, wherever we pop up next, if there is a point of time where it doesn't make sense anymore, it's like, we're going to be also representing those people, um, in the future or new people it, it yeah we're acknowledging and uh, kind of embracing the flux of it I don't know if that answers your question it was a really interesting point about um this consent about if this doesn't make sense to us anymore we will stop I think that's what is one of the things that separates um, kind of an alternative space from an institutional space I think I realized with a with a past collective that once you start prioritizing the legacy and survivability of the organization above the people, it, that's, that's when you have decided that you are an institution. Um, 
and that the institution must must like survive the people um and uh mm -hmm. I, I don't know if anyone has thoughts about that i just like might have definitely like um i think le legacy is so important because that's that's so much pressure and i think like um it makes sense you know you you bring this thing into life and you see this um, amazing project materialize and you love it so much so like i get that you know it can be hard to maybe let go especially when you come so far and the community you know is really receptive and you know you're really well integrated but yeah i, I agree i think like um that's actually a new sort of thing that, that i'm hearing you know and realizing too that like time has a direct correlation to institution or the process of becoming or snowballing into something bigger mm -hmm. um like i even know that x based cultural center is so the the my full-time job the artist run center that i work at um like many spaces that came before it it was really a space like heart it was you know a group of people that were just making something happen and then you know granting and funding comes into play and longevity in the conversation of like a lifespan, you know, transforms it into something new. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like the, the legacy piece, when it starts snowballing to become really such a big snowball that you forget the heart of the beginning or the heart of it all, I guess. And then, yeah. And then how, how much are institutions willing to let go that big snowball and yeah like yeah are they willing to let it go and then like where where it merges in a way where yeah that you can still know where the heart is <laughs> oh my god <laughs> a little cheesy there no but i think that cheesiness is like that that sort of like um the sentiment of it all like it it, it makes a lot of sense like we are like I guess every space in every field is going to have personal stakes, but, you know, art is a part of, like, it can get so personal. So I, I really feel like in, in order to, like, respect it as a space that's living, you kind of have to, like, love has to be involved. That's cheesy, <laughs> but it's true. We are all young at heart. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love, I love what you said, Bo, about that. I, I think about it a lot. Yeah, I think about it a lot because, uh, well, Kai is the only institution in such a small community and it is kind of the heart of the community it does everything. And it's like, yes, yes to everything. And it, it can really easily become a big snowball. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, and and then, yeah, just bringing that out. It's uh, the like it's like institutional space and alternative space is here and it's it's together and collaborating. It's like every, all the possibilities of different forms, yes. <laughs> and it would, some will die, some will come back and it just keeps on, it, it's a continuum, right? And I'm sure like, it's, this is a, isn't new. It's, it's always been there since, you know, in just different forms, I guess. Mm -hmm. That part about what you said, Bo, about Kai doing like everything and having to say yes to everything because there's no one else to like take care of that. Or I, I think it kind of goes into back to this idea that alternative spaces kind of uh, dilute this monopoly of of uh, culture making that that can happen in in big and small cities, like even in Toronto, there's, uh, it, it feels so much like sometimes one unnamed bank <laughs> funds most of things. <laughs> yeah, something you said earlier, Florence, as well, about just that the relational aspect of, of working on similar projects. And I think, think about that institutional context as well and legacy and you know, once I think when you become an institution, it really is when you're thinking about legacy and you're thinking about longevity, and part of that's tied to funding and mandates. But I think that kind of changes the narrative 
from relational and personal to institutional, quote unquote, whatever that means. And I think that means inter impersonal or sort of not people centered, where it's either a physical space or it's the organizational name or, you know, it's a board or it's some other manifestation as opposed to just four people that started a collective or two people that started a project together. So I think, yeah, you kind of lose a bit of that, the people centered approach mm -hmm. to it as becoming an institution. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat stuff. Me too, I love the chat. <laughs> Fire chat, there's pretty rarely a engaged chat. <laughs> in fact, I mean, feel free to ask us questions anytime. Interrupt us, please. Because um, I'll lose track of what I've said and I will no longer know the context of my question. Um, we had also we had a pre-chat about this conversation and I think we had like a couple spicy questions about what were we talking about oh it was something along things. the lines of like um I mean I could just be totally missing it but we were talking about like what what defines an institution Right. That, was that one of the questions or did I just dream that? Yeah, no, that's 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 one of the things I think we're we're talking about. What what is an institution and what kind of how do we define it or what exists outside of you know institutions? And I think funding as well was something that we kind of triangulated as a key part of the, those conversations of what an institution is and how they exist or how they shape the work that gets done. Mm -hmm. And we also mentioned, I think we, we were talking about how like, it, it's that Venn diagram of like f money and time. <laughs> My Venn diagram. <laughs> um, yeah, because you know, it, that that's what happens with a lot of like spaces, you know, it, it snowballs into something bigger and then it feeds back to what we were saying about legacy um, and a board, the presence of a board is, is, a, is, a, is a key indicator. Yeah, some sort of structure. I don't know how it, yeah, it becomes now because now there's probably more, or I can see like more institutions that aren't actual spaces, but more virtual spaces. And how would that snowball in the, into the, from the future? And um, yeah, and I, uh, oh yeah, oh, I want, I wrote this down <laughs> of letting go. And I don't know why. But, uh, another part about like, yeah, funding and um, like intentions within institutions and how they're letting go, letting go uh, funders that uh, have, are corporations and you know what banks that like, are they willing to let go of, yeah like the yeah people that fund in that way and um that aren't supporting land vendors <laughs> you know so yeah how much are institutions able to let that go and you know and what kind of art are they really doing that are current and part of what we're talking about and questioning yeah. I see a, a question in the chat here. Maybe it's a good, it's a good one to bring up at this point. What are examples of alternative spaces artists still need to explore? So, what are some of the unexplored spaces that artists could be thinking about? While you all think, maybe I'll jumpstart this. This conversation. Um, working in local government, in, we have an artist in residence program as well, and we also have an indigenous artist in residence program. And the idea is really bringing artists to the table, you know, to kind of seed creativity in everything we do, whether it's a road design or 
it's a light standard or it's a park redevelopment project, right? There, there can be sort of creativity at every level and without sort of shoeboxing or pigeonholing art as a painting or a sculpture or a light installation, you know, it's, it's really that creative lens and bringing that approach to it. And, and yeah, I mean, just as a, my background in kind of urban planning as well, sometimes I think in the planning practice, we try to over plan for spaces. And I think sometimes, I think the art world is kind of guilty of this too sometimes where we try to fill up a gallery or an exhibition space, at least in the visual arts, you know, it's like having just one work in a room isn't enough, you know? And, and so then that kind of presupposes other spaces for art or conversations. But, but yeah, I think just as one way of like, just bringing artists to the table and kind of questioning what is art and where, where is art relevant is a good starting point to kind of explore alternative spaces because it could be, you know, the everyday mundane, like on your bus commute, on your transit commute. And there's a lot of that as well now where you see a lot more public art in transit because it's like, where do people spend time? It's something yeah. I just like to think of personally and like where, where can they actually connect and have space to engage. This is interesting also on the flip side, because right now that just made me think about the Bentway. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, the Bentway as a kind of like real estate project um, that's happened in downtown Toronto. Uh, but any sort of kind of alternative space, especially in public art, I find I don't want to like romanticize alternative spaces too because they, they can be such a um, a driver of yeah gentrification art washing and this kind of um, occupation of a space and what you were saying was like over determining what that space could be used for um, the Bentway itself is like a, a place for like skating and art but it can kind of only be those things. Like they shut off the lights at night so that people will not stay there. Um, there's like outlets there. So people who don't usually have access to electricity can camp out there if they wanted to, but because it's supposed to be a pristinely art driven space, um, it, it's kind of set off because of that. Um, I'm not sure where my... <laughs> where my point was going with that. But perhaps just like uh, the, the idea that although we need more art in many places, I think the, the ways that even um, alternative things and even small groups can be co-opted into kind of occupying a space for corporations. I, I see your point, Florence. I mean, yeah, 100% agree with kind of that gentrification conversation. I think something to think about in that context is also that how we kind of frame art, right? Is it is it sacred? You know, my my reference point would be churches or sacred spaces, you know, for any religion or culture, right? It has a very specific and a particular purpose and it's nobody else is allowed to use it or access it for anything else other than it's sacred purpose and are we doing that the same with art you know are we creating these new spaces and saying okay this is an art space like you're saying you turn off the lights or you know you don't let people just skateboard in a gallery or rollerblade in because it's you know you have to respect the art mm -hmm. and sure there is there there are these boundaries i think sometimes yeah we in the art world we kind of tend to overdo these boundaries that that almost then become exclusive mm -hmm. to other groups mm -hmm. At what point when it becomes gatekeeping and not really there's access for other community members that would need that space right and yeah alternative spaces like i think institutional you 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 have like you know this established land i guess and then whereas when you're alter the alternative space you're there's this like conversation well I guess that was a waking up call for me when that conversation where who owns this land I know it's trying to switch in but in this colonial world it's like oh I have to go through all these steps to like talk to city and and like 
there's these protocols that like colonial protocols that you have to go through for alternative spaces and yeah and like uh, and then whose community you're holding and like creating that space and seeing it and who, who are you taking care of those are the questions that <laughs> I think about and not sleep <laughs> And then that brings us back to um, what, what we were talking about just before about accountability, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm even just thinking like, you, you know, alternative spaces, you know, in, in my little research, um, you know, I've seen art spaces uh, at so many different scales and at so many different like weird places, like someone's window, someone's closet, um, someone's like a, like, could be like a, a space could be inside someone's car um so i think like in in what i've kind of been learning about artists and spaces uh it's not a matter of like um what other spaces need to be explored because so much is happening all the time but it's it's kind of like demystifying the sort of um to, to be like anybody can start a space. Like it, it is a lot of work and it's very challenging. Yeah. Sorry. That was, wait, not, that was, that was an interruption. Um, but yeah, no, as I was saying, it's like, <laughs> it's gone, but um yeah, this sort of uh, anybody can start a space. It can look like many different things. It's just about demystifying and saying that, yes, you can actually do it. But in tossing it back to something like accountability, you know, the idea of gatekeeping it is really like recurring in my mind because it's like, who's, who's car, right? Like who's, who's closet? Um, it's a sort of question that Hearth has been asking herself. It's like, who do we represent? Um, and what does community mean to us? And I think in the scope of artists run spaces and alternative spaces, it can kind of become a little bit insular and maybe uninviting. Um, and we definitely don't want to like gatekeep on that regard. So yeah, it, it's a totally subjective thing. It's sort of like go where you can, but also who you're representing in these spaces where you've gone. Does that make sense? Um, Sana also asks, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on the boundaries of institutional spaces. I feel like something I see is grassroots spaces become institutionalized and struggle with the fact that they can't operate in the same ways anymore. Have any of you gone through that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think some of the, the public art projects that I worked on at the I think for BNL, it was really interesting because there's kind of two ends of the spectrum where one of it's really about showcasing or using kind of cutting edge or you know contemporary art in a way that generates a lot of community conversation. And that in itself has a lot of tension in built into it, right? It's kind of building around community, but using an art form and using artists and that are maybe not local or that are not in a certain context, right? And and so, yeah, those, those kind of soft edges of institutional boundaries, always kind of poking around and trying to find where, where again, in that Venn diagram, does community and art kind of intersect? And, and that's the objective and kind of constantly reminding myself is really that's, that's the purpose of, you know, doing what I was doing or doing what kind of the organizational mandate was, is community at the end of the day. So sort of centering it around that was a good way of, going around or going outside of the institutional framework as well to think think about our my role and like sort of the role of the projects that we were we were working on. This reminds me of my uncle who always well, is in Cantonese, which is kind of a blur. At the moment, but I'll try it, like how. This reminds me of my uncle who always goes in Cantonese. Oh, that's my voice. <laughs> I'll try it, like how. This reminds me of my uncle. Oh, Jason Clarkson, oh. would you mind muting? 
<laughs> Thank you. Ah, there. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes. My uncle. So, um, like, this can do these things. Or you always say, like, writing text is, is not, like, in stone. It's, like, it's uh, written by humans. And humans are fluid. And it... So I, I think of that in institutions, how we kind of have to keep on remembering that like humans made the institution and don't let the institution make you. <laughs> and that's all I'm thinking about that. Sana, if you could uh, uh, like hop on and like, verbalize some of what your thoughts about the boundaries of institutional spaces mean. Uh, I think that'd be great. Yes, hi. Yeah, um, I guess I was just thinking like, it's something I think about a lot in a in the capacity of making space. Um, so I'm a co-organizer of Making Space, which is a peer mentorship group for early career BIPOC artists. And um, we're a really new space and um, we, our access to like institutional funding has been really like um, iffy and like we um, have have we're not a nonprofit or anything like we're just a we're just an organization we're a, we're a group um, so we have like uh, partnered with nonprofits like our artist run centers in order to access like uh, operational funding um, and because we are not a nonprofit ourselves like we have a lot of flexibility in the ways that well we have more flexibility in the ways that we um, run we can make decisions uh, that like without necessarily like being accountable to like larger funding bodies. And um, we have a lot of like autonomy in the way that we can like make art and like make protest, um, which is really nice. But when we think about the long-term future of the space, um, it, it's hard, right? Because like we, I mean, I we would love like job security and funding security. And I would love to like know that I will have money for programming next year or in the year after, um, but also, when we get that security, we are tied to the rules of these like institutional funding bodies. And um, also just like uh, the like different set of rules that um, artists runs uh, tend to play by. Like, I think we've seen, I mean, in Calgary, I've certainly seen a reckoning in the artist run center culture where um, the needs of the community are often not met because when I feel like when something happens, um, there's so many layers of the institution that like things need to be discussed on that like, it just takes so long for anything to happen. And by the time the institution has a response, it's too late. Um, and I think a lot of these, like, like I, I see like previous grassroots spaces that um, are now institutional or now, or like, like learning how to operate with a board and stuff like that and can't respond with the same like speed and urgency that the community sometimes needs. Um, and so I guess it's like, um, yeah, I guess I, I, I wonder what the, what the trade-off is. Like, I, I guess there's no real like right answer. I would love to just like have money all the time and not have to be accountable to anyone about it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, I think a lot of what you're saying, Sana, was, just comes brings me to mind. Um, I'm part of this um, program that the EU is kind of funding. It's like a global cultural leadership program, and it's open to people from all over the world, to kind of young cultural professionals. And something they started implementing from the last year was that bringing funding to the table and keeping it really open-ended for for networks of peers who are part of this program to pitch projects and really just run, run them, you know, and, and it's really open-ended. Like it's the only kind of, the only one limitation is that it, there has to be an EU country member in there just because of the funding mechanism that it is European taxpayer money. But other than that, they're kind of like really keeping it wide open. And I'm kind of hopeful that models like that are, are gonna be more and more the future of funding bodies too, of, you know, just really working with with individuals or groups of people and and that redefining accountability, essentially. Like accountability doesn't have to be a board of 12 that consists of lawyers, you know, real estate professionals or 
bankers or financiers. It can be other people. It can be everyday people in the community. You know, how, how do we redefine accountability from that perspective? Because right now it takes a current shape and a structure and that structure and shape can be different. You know, I, I don't know. I think there can be accountability, but in a different form. Yeah, I was um, thinking back to, to that rift and I think we're kind of talking about the same thing that I had also kind of witnessed. And I do think there was kind of like a, an enabling that the pandemic had of, the, of this and of how easy it was to like miscommunicate and not communicate um, and how easy it is to just avoid things when we're all online. Um, and there, yeah, definitely it seems that it doesn't even seem like boards help accountability because it sometimes they're just used to feign like there's some sort of accountability, but in essence, like they stop decisions from being made if we need like unanimity. It's, it, it feels like it's meant to be a stop for change to happen. If there always has to be like a hundred percent on board with something to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I don't even think like boards are a great decision either. <laughs> I mean, what would it be in the alternative, I guess? Um, yeah, like even even with the community members, like I, everyone has like disagreements and yeah, my, my train of thought is going much towards like many of the like corruptions and abuses of power that I've seen, but um, yeah, both both in institutional and the DIY like space. Um, when there is no one to be really there to keep you in check, like there could be so much power grabbing and um, kind of just taking and running with something. When I first uh, joined the board, uh, it was challenging. The language, the process, everything. and. Yeah, and like with, so I'm just like, oh, even if there's artists in the table or like not just lawyers, I guess in bigger city, there's a fast, different uh, people on the table. And yeah, and I find like it's quite challenging and not very accessible for, um, like you're, it's quite uh, ableist if you like, want to be on the board and have access to internet and uh, be, you know, um, uh, email literate and, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, the board don't really represent the community and and there's such a, maybe a stretch every now and again. Yeah, I think I've gotten all of my like information and education about what boards do from like seeing them rather than anyone having ever told me what they are. I'm, I'm pretty sure I still don't know what like the official definition of a board is. And I wonder where that kind of literacy can come into play in like everyday life um, or, or like education or something <laughs> um, if that, needs to be done but probably not it's very niche knowledge or not no I don't think it should be niche knowledge no I, I don't think so of course I think in yeah I mean I think the crux of what a board or where a board comes from is is fiduciary responsibility and in layman's language because again we love these technical jargon too often we use that it's really that they're financially accountable at the end of the day for for money that's that's given to the organization or their expenses. And, and so they're fundamentally no different than a corporation board of directors that are responsible to their shareholders. So they're still um, sort of tied in very closely, you know, even though there, there are differences, but at the root of it, it's really about financial accountability. You know, yeah, but I they guess can't be com compensated monetarily. And that's that's a big sticking point as well, I guess, for especially for, for people of color and, and indigenous people. 
and just immigrant communities, right? Where having access to free labor and free time is a privilege for a lot of people, you know? And then again, having that access and resources to learn about what a board does and board governance and being part of boards, there's a big gap in those areas. And there's some groups definitely that are trying to work on that, but just overall on the spectrum, there's, there's a lot of work to educate. And yeah, it should be kind of, if, that, if that's the prevalent model that we're going with and we're working with is a not-for-profit boards, then that information should be commonly accessible. Yeah, I guess just to um, echo um, what, can everyone hear me? Yeah, right, can, okay, cool. <laughs> um, I guess uh, just to echo whatever you, everyone's saying, I think uh, I'm thinking a lot about um, the idea of like free labor, additional labor. So in, in terms of like uh, a board dynamic, you see two things happening. So uh, it depends on different scales. So uh, smaller artists run spaces uh, with boards, it's either, it's people who like um, are just really passionate about it and like are just, are further in precarity, just being on this board and doing all of this free labor or at a larger scale, it's people who just like have the wealth and the time to do that. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but more so just like some of the tack on. Um, there's actually a lot of questions, so maybe I'll go to Mark Reinhardt's, who asked, sometimes installing work in alternative spaces can necessitate more collaboration because the pathways to common ground aren't all as well traveled as when trying to install work in more traditional spaces. What perspectives do you think are important to bring to the table when pursuing a collab that is directly to directed towards alternative spaces? And if an organization or institution is approaching you for partnership, what perspectives does the institution have to bring to the collab? Uh, I get I, the the my my gut reaction to that last one is just like the institution got the money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not to say that the institution doesn't have ideas as well, but yeah, I'm like in in my experiences at at Hearth collaborating with larger spaces, it's always been a matter of like they can so give us the funds to reach a bit past what we could do <laughs> with no money. So yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking too. <laughs> Um, for the other part of the question, um, what perspectives? I just, I guess like site specificity for me is just always important, like knowing where you are, knowing who comes here every day, know, knowing, I guess, the general like layout and history of a place. Um, those feel important to me. Yeah, I think that was, I mean, similarly to you, Florence, I think some of the, the public art projects that I got to work on, those were some of the most exciting opportunities to, to learn about different groups or different spaces, even their histories and connect with different communities that otherwise my life might not have intersected with, or I might not have, like I sometimes go by those spaces, but I don't stop and think about them the same way because all of a sudden I'm trying to think about the space in the context of art and what it means or an installation. So that relational perspective and kind of bringing narratives together or just learning about narratives and communities that were there before and that aren't visible too. And I think that's something as well, I think we, we kind of touched upon in our discussion earlier, just about permissions and you know being on indigenous land or being somewhere that's not a clean canvas historically. So how do we work? work even in alternative spaces, in public spaces, knowing that they're not clean slates or blank canvases? Um, I, I'm sorry to change the topic. I'm just looking at the chat and Sana has given us this question from Facebook. It says, uh, I guess what you're talking about is the idea of many publics. Uh, who are we serving and why? Um, yeah, my, my first reaction to that reminds me of how, you know, Hearth is situated at Bathurst and Ulster Street in Toronto, and it's a really residential area. 
I'm grateful to have a garage that's like really accessible from the street. It's that trope of artist run spaces where like you need to like go into an alleyway and make two turns to the left and like go down a flight of stairs into a, the third room on the right to find the space. So uh, the fact that hearth is really easily accessible from the street is nice. Um, but also, you know, in, in doing so, our community is brought to that space. Uh, and they're enjoying our programming, but what does it mean to ex exist alongside the neighborhood? So the idea of many publics, you know, we're thinking a lot about that in terms of how we're engaging, you know, the, the, the site that we're in and the neighborhood. Um, and oftentimes, like, it's half-half. People will come in just really curiously wondering what we're doing, or, like, people will walk by and I'll be like, there's art happening here and you're welcome. So yeah, that was just generally my sort of thought process behind that question. So thank you to whoever asked it. Anyone else have anything to add on that one? Um, yeah, um, I guess for here it's the two projects. Well, the first project that I did was like a, like a DIY northernmost dragon dance during Chinese New Year and I was pretty much the one Chinese person here in Dawson and um but it was an offering because I was working at this uh, community kitchen with a Tronda kitchen and it kind of a little snowball of like who are you why are you here and to talking about Chinese New Year and then and then it became, oh, I'm gonna make a giant dragon and share my culture to the elders here. And then, so then, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, public. Anyways, so yeah, kind of like that relationship connecting, not building, but just like connecting and um, that reciprocity of like, okay, I'm here. So what am I offering to share? yeah in this space and yeah i don't know the answer but i just that image popped out of like yeah doing public space work and what your relationship with the community is like yeah it's a really good question of sort of who are the public and who are our audiences and Sometimes they seem oppositional, or at least in some some kind of project context that I've worked on, that there's certain groups that that really love no change, you know. And I mean, in in a lot of in the, in the housing context, especially, you know, NIMBYism and kind of not in my backyard and not having things change, right? So it's it's always really it's been a tough thought process and conversations for for me personally. Is just thinking about well, yeah, who has kind of this authority and opportunity to speak and who do we hear the loudest as well, typically. And it's typically people that have the time and the ability and the means to come and be heard. So that kind of made me think of, you know, how do we reach the folks who we don't hear from? You know, how do we make those opportunities, whether it's going to their spaces, whether it's community centers, it's, you know, food halls, again, different cultures, different traditions, right? Where some people gather around food other people gather at City Hall and reaching those groups to hear from them as well was, was kind of something I tried to, to embed to make it as much as accessible as sort of possible within context. Yeah, there's, um, there's kind of this lack of reciprocity when we're talking about like working with some institutions because usually uh, the institution brings in this alternative group rather than the alternative group receives the institution um, in, in kind of a, a host manner. But I can also think about how, if this is a community that wouldn't really want them there either, that, yeah, it's like up to their agency of what to, like who to welcome. But it, it's, it's stark what, what uh, like a big gallery expects to do uh, or expects to be a venue when it comes to um, inviting in like marginalized communities. It's not about them going to that space and learning, but more so 
getting presented information um, as a kind of limited, uh, limited range of we are here to give you money in exchange for something rather than maybe something more long-term and reciprocal. There was also something interesting I saw in the chat oops, uh, by Anna uh, saying, I think we need to develop new languages, new emotional mapping to acknowledge the past dysfunctions and yet be able to root ourselves in the present and future. Um, I, I was reminded how um, many different collectives in Toronto have been trying for a long time to quite literally map out where alternative spaces and alternative groups have been working for the past like decades because we are typically so isolated and um, because it feels that especially for like queer people of color uh, that we're somehow always the first ones to have done something when that is definitely not true. <laughs> um, and uh, especially the fun dysfunctions. I, I think uh, having a list of like where places were and why they ended is would be such an interesting project. Um, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> especially the ones that ended during the pandemic. Yeah, um, that feels like a, a really good thought to end on, I think. Um, thank you guys so much for this lovely conversation. I'm just gonna put my cat down. Perfect timing. Um, and the thank fourth, you. The fourth Sorry. panelist. Yeah, <laughs> she's the star of the show. A brief um, appearance, all you need. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yes. And thank you to our audience so much for listening and participating in this conversation as well. Um, for those who are interested in learning more about Create Space, the link to the residency will be posted in the chat. And Create Space is also creating a public art forum for emerging artists who identify as Black, Indigenous, uh, or racialized and are between the ages of 18 to 25. And that call for submissions is open right now as well. And that link will be posted in the chat too. Um, and uh, you will see some familiar speakers in that as well. Um, so thank you uh, all for your time today. Thanks everybody. Okay. Yes, I'm so grateful to have shared this space with all of you. I could have talked for hours, um, but you know, if any of you in the audience want to continue the conversation, feel free to stay updated with us, Instagram, social media, DM us, you know where to find me, you know where to find Hearth. Uh, thank you to Steps for putting this together. Yeah, I love the conversation. There's so many, so many comments, so much narrative, and I think yeah, it's definitely one of the more engaged discussion groups that I've been a part of. And I love, yeah, just it's really like just a conversation. So thanks. Yeah, this chat thanks. is everything. <laughs> yeah, that was it. a pretty, pretty amazing chat. Yeah, thanks. My my juices is are flowing. <laughs> going boo, 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 boo. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Beautiful energy. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care.